this is the Ryan Marketing Show, and you're listening to episode 24 of 100. Today, I'm joined by Jules Brogdon from Collaboration Wines in Hawke's Bay, and we're going to be talking all about starting a winery, wine branding, and what it takes to make great wine. Um, so I guess first question for you, Jules, is how did you get started? Wow. Well, um probably go back a bit now. Um, so I was in Napa Valley. Well, I started here in Hawke's Bay. If I sort of backtrack um, through my, basically through my degree, starting at the age of 17 and um, studying here in Hawke's Bay. And then I decided I wanted to travel with it. So I headed over to Napa Valley, California. And I ended up staying there for eight years. And it was pretty much just working for small premium producers and really where attention to detail and just quality was, um, was at the top of sort of what they did. Um, and this sort of the more I spent there, the more time I spent there um, and the more I worked with different producers, um, I realised that I really wanted to get into the top end level and um, I took a couple of back steps and took seller hand positions actually to get into some really top end producers that had a real cop following and um, it was hard work and to be honest it was hard work being a female um, because of the smaller producers you work with the more you have to be hands on, um, you have to be sort of mechanical, you have to be sort of a combination of everything, the science, the chemistry, work the seller and you have to be able to work on your feet. And um, they always preferred once you sort of, to have the males, and they'd usually put you into the laboratory. But um, I was pretty, always very much a sort of a hands-on person, so it was just natural to me that I did the cellar in the laboratory, etc. Um, and I... Um, so... Yeah, one, and not, uh, I'd kind of been there in the Napa Valley for it was about three, four years, and then I um, took the seller hand job at a top end producer, this cult producer, Lewis Sellers, and um, really that was the opening to sort of working for attention to detail premium winemaking. I really, they loved what they did. Um, everything was just about the quality of the wine, and um, and it was also about the ethos of the company, and they wanted everyone to have a really good time. You know, it was about food, it was about wine. Um, we'd get chefs in from the local um, restaurants to come in and cook, and, um, and you spent so many hours there, but it didn't matter because it was so enjoyable, okay. and everyone shared the same passion, and you kind of thrived on it. And the valley itself was so... Um, I mean, it was cutthroat. Um, most of the wineries are making 40, 80, 100 buck wines. So they're not dealing with the entry level. And I mean, that's the side I saw. I did see the other side to it, but um, the more you sort of start to get up into that top end premium, the more, um, I mean, I didn't make a wine under $40. So, and I think to be immersed in that and to be immersed in, I mean, you could um, drive up and down the Napa Valley and restaurant after restaurant, but it was top class. Like, there's sommeliers at every restaurant there's. And I think to be, um, to be involved at that at such a young age and grow up in that in my 20s, so I spent eight years there, it was just really, it opened my eyes and I guess my palate got really immersed amongst some, you know, top end. So I learned a heck of a lot. And... Um, they really know their stuff over there. Um, you know, they've been doing it for generations. Families have been doing it for generations, both on the viticulture side and the winemaking side. And um, and the winemakers, you know, study. They've got top university there, Davis University and Fresno State, but um, very highly regarded. And um, so, yeah, I think just to be immersed in it was pretty amazing. Um, so I did time here, eight years total, and then um, 
I ended up doing a stunt. I actually thought I'd leave. It was about 2000, 2008, and I thought to myself, well, I kind of wanted to see something else. And I ended up heading down to Margaret River, Western Australia. Yep. And again, working with Bordeaux's, Bordeaux varietals and Chardonnay. And that's what I'd worked a lot with in uh, um, Napa Valley. Yeah. And um, again, I walked in, worked at a, um, for a producer that had a lot of small producers or cult, cult following sort of small producers under its sort of umbrella. And um, so again, to be in, sort of work alongside lots of different winemakers and you sort of get to see what they do and um, their approaches and that. And then I got offered, um, uh, the Lewis sellers asked me back to take up the assistant winemaker full-time. It was sort of assistant winemaker, winemaker role um, back in, back in California. Yeah, and I mean, it was too good an opportunity to turn down because they had a really top cult following. The minute you get into one of those, you can be headhunted and it just your, your career starts opening up and job opportunities. The money's great. So you were really using your initial study in New Zealand as like the international passport to winemaking to at least Correct. get the foot in the door in Napa yeah. Valley. Yeah. And then at that stage when you initially landed, yeah. you had a very clear direction to go towards the quality end of the market and cult end of the market. What what exactly yeah. what does cult mean for someone that's not a wine aficionado? What what is a a cult wine versus a um, you know run of the mill variety. I guess cult. Um, what I saw with a cult following over there was you know they've got databases, direct databases, where people are signed up in advance. The wine's pretty much sold before it gets out the before it's you know even finished. Um, they have no hesita- no problem in selling 80, 100 buck wines. It's there. Um, so cult meaning that there is already so much demand for this wine correct. that it's pre-sold even before the, the grapes are kind of yeah. grown. And I mean that's probably a big broad generalisation but there's definitely, you see that. Yeah, okay. absolutely. Yeah. And um, they've also got the population to sustain it. Of course they're just an hour out of San Francisco. I mean they've got the whole of California. I mean most of the wines people wouldn't even see outside of New Zealand. I mean, outside of California, I should say, outside of the States, yeah. So you would have seen a few differences moving from Napa to then Margaret River, both in winemaking styles and also approach to the market with the wines. Yeah, Uh, absolutely. How do you use, or how is that experience now, um, how do you have learned from that for Collaboration Wines, which is your, your own New Zealand brand of wine? Exactly. I think that is what I've every every winery I've been to, and every time you're out in a restaurant, or every time you just you observe, you watch, and you look at how and what wines are seen or perceived in the marketplace that are incredibly good versus maybe those that aren't. Or you look at the packaging, you look at the whole sort of presence of the wine, even down to you know the winemaking. You know what makes a wine so incredibly good that it starts to get a cult following. And you taste the wines, all these different wines, you know, there's so, there's so many out there that um, you taste them and you go, okay, well that's mediocre, but that comes from a big producer. Or well, here's a top end wine, you taste it and you go, oh my God, this is so incredibly good. Like, it just goes on and on and on and lingers in the mouth and you just go, and you just, I mean, it goes straight through you. And I think, does that answer your question? Does that sort of... Well, it kind of does, so that I guess there's, yeah. there's two elements to it. Before we get onto the, the, you know, the technical wine side of things, yeah. um, yeah. you know, whether, you're, whether you're eating or drinking, the first thing you're looking at is, is the visual side of it. Yeah. Uh, and what I've noticed with Collaboration Wines is you, you've taken a, a different approach and a, yeah. and a super visual approach to your wine labelling. Yeah. So talk us through what, what was the thinking around that. Um, yeah, so... <laughs> I, I mean, that eight years in Napa Valley, and um, I ended up renting a room from the artist. Um, she became a very good friend of mine, and um, beautiful artwork in the living room, and just, she's pretty amazing. She works between San Francisco and Napa Valley, and um, it's very abstract artwork, and I was very drawn to it, and I, personally, I love art, and um, I find it very creative, and 
I love going and seeing art shows or art galleries, etc. So uh, it is a passion of mine as well. And um, I was drawn to her artwork and I thought, there was one day we were sitting in the living room just having a glass of wine and I said, she had this one painting in there. And um, she did it for a client in New York and um, it was called Aja which means of the colour silver. Ah, that's what that means. Yeah, yeah. so, um, beautiful big painting. And I, I just used to love it. And I just used to sit there and look at it. And um, this, anyway, as it turned out, years on, when I came back to New Zealand, the client, it, the, the painting never sold to the client. The client decided the colours went right for the living room. And I thought, well, I want that, I want that painting. And that's going to front my first wine. Um, this is before you started collaboration? This or? is before I started. Okay. So this is really in advance. You were, yeah. you were almost building your business as you were working for other people's business. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I thought that's going to front my Cabernet Sauvignon and I'm going to do Cabernet Sauvignon as my first wine. And yes, it's a challenge in Hawke's Bay, straight cab. Um, but with all my experience in California, which is quite a right climate, or a climate that produces right wines, my time in Margaret River and working in Hawke's Bay, I mean, I've just developed a love for Cabernet. Um, it's strong. It's, um, it's kind of no bullshit to it. <laughs> I guess it probably best describes me straight down the line, maybe. Um, but it's gutsy, and it's, it's just a beautiful wine if done well. And they, they say the king, um, Cabernet is king. Well, I kind of have to agree sometimes. And it hangs out there all season. And it hangs out through the rain and the wind and the yeah, disease pressure. And it's usually it's the last to ripen. And um, if you get the season right, um, it's a stunning wine. And it's a wine that will age well and um, you can sell it. Okay, so knowing that about yep. uh, how you wanted to present the wine yep. uh, and having that foresight and knowing the, the mm. variety then you wanted to match with that yep. uh, wine labelling, mm -hmm. coming back to Hawke's Bay, how did you then yeah. take those ideas into you know, finding grapes to buy or an, an area to be yeah. able to... How do you go from that idea to actually bring it to life and doing the hard work of a vintage and yeah. starting to bottle it? Yeah, so it was it was tough. So I came back in 08, um, and I knew there was going to be no jobs here in Hawke's Bay. So I was like, well, I need to I need to create something a long term future for myself here in Hawke's Bay. And um, so that's when I said to myself, well, I just hit my 30s. I, I thought if I need to get started, I need to get started now. And it's going to be a slow build up. And because um, financially, to be able to do it, I mean, in the industry, especially here, you don't get paid the big bucks like you do in Napa. I went from Napa down to uh, basically a seller hand's salary. And um, so in 2000, I mean, 2010, or well, just prior to that, obviously, because I needed to plan, we just said, I need to put down my first, my first tonne of fruit. <laughs> so it was one tonne, and I thought, well, that's going to give me, what, a thousand bottles. And I thought, so we'll start with that, and I can probably afford that. And um, with my savings from um, California. And um, so I thought, well, <laughs> this is going to look embarrassing, going to the big producers and going, can I have one tonne of fruit, but I actually want to work on that one tonne. I want to do the viticulture work myself. So um, I actually went to Craggy Range because I knew they'd have, they've got beautiful, uh, stunning vineyards, their viticulture's top notch, they've got the right sites, etc. And um, I said, oh, I'm, I'm after one tonne of fruit, but I want to come in and work it myself. And they were like, okay. And um, so we came up with a contract, a small contract. And um, so that was 2010. So I worked the, I worked the vines that year. And um, I put down my first Cabernet, 2010 Argent Cabernet Sauvignon. And um, so in the meantime, so I sort of was thinking about this. I thought, well, if we can get this up and going, at the same time, while I was, I'm working full time still, so this is working on, my vineyard during, working on the vineyard during the weekends and in the evenings after my main job. So That's a bit of juggling. It is a bit of juggling. But I kind of just was just so driven yeah. there. It's just I've got this final goal in mind. I need to hit it, and um, so it was two ten. And then 
the next year I decided, well, I've got this one Cabernet, but I can't just come out with one wine. It looks a bit, it's kind of no impact there. So I decided then, I was like, well, what other wine do I love making? And it's like, well, Chardonnay. And um, again, barrel fermented Chardonnay. So this time I said to Angela, the artist, I said, I really want you to create a piece of artwork that complements um, Arjun, that is going to be my barrel fermented Chardonnay. And um, so she actually painted this one especially for, yeah. Ah, so my, the second one became a commission. Yes, Excellent. which is Orlant Chardonnay. Is that how you say it, Orlant? Orlant, which means the colour gold. And actually this is an interesting one because at the time um, I had designers in San Francisco. Oh, Angela had some really good friends. Um, uh, he's based out of San Francisco, very well-known designer, and she was telling him, about what I was up to and he really loved the concept and that and he loved the name of the company Collaboration Wines and he's like I want to help her out I want to help put together her labels for her and um, for, for a reasonable price and we can do a wine swap and I was like well this is awesome because um, Tom Ingalls has got his Ingalls design um, he's based in San Francisco he's got a really good he's got an incredible portfolio um, so to actually have him say that was like, well, this is really cool. So I was like, okay. And that way he could work with the artist on the other end and back in the, back in the States and um, sort of and talking to me at the same time um, about how we were going to put the labels together. So um, that was the first two wines. So and with those with those first two, yeah. uh, this is now your dream brought to life. Yeah. You've bottled it, labelled it. Uh, sell it for a, a certain amount of time. Yeah. Then that moment happens that you've actually got to go and knock on a door somewhere yeah. and show them your vision and yeah. let them taste it. Uh, where did you go first? What was their reaction? And yeah. how did how did that all go? How did you choose? Um, you know where you went first. Yeah. Um, yeah, that was pretty daunting. I have to say it was sort of because it's kind of like your baby, and then it's like, yeah, well, I I like it. I, I, I'm pretty sure I know it's good, but <laughs> it's putting it out there. And, and everyone has an opinion. And everyone's yeah. got an opinion, and wine's so... It's individual. And, um, and I thought, well, you know what, stuff it, you know. If people are going to like it, people are going to be drawn to my wine, so... It's up to them, and it's up to individuals to decide. And um, so I started... I just started tapping on the restaurants around Hooks Bay, to be honest. Um, and at Vintage, I went in and saw them and um, sort of said, hey, here's my first two wines and would you be interested in putting, tasting them and putting them in your shop? And of course, they said yes. And then so that started, there's the first sale. And then the next sale was, um, oh, I think we had the Emporium at the time. The Emporium took on my 2011 um, Orland. And that sold really well there. So it's pretty exciting. And then uh, Mint Restaurant. And Mint Restaurant was that was that was really cool because I'd sort of known Steve, Steve and Ruth. They own Mint, and I kind of met Steve while I was working as a seller hand on the bottling line. And um, he said, "Well, I'm going to start up my restaurant, Mint Restaurant." And he goes, and I said, "Well, here's my 210 cab. It was in barrel at the time." I said, "Taste this," and he said, "Well, when the restaurant's up and going, come and see me." I'm like, "Okay." <laughs> So I did, and they've, they've listed the wines, and they've still got the wines on, and um, they've been going really well with them. But it was kind of one place after another, and it sort of started with a case a month, <laughs> sort of 12 bottles, and then, you know, friends and family. And then I got the website up and going, and um, sort of just slowly, and I just started bringing, um, like, wine stores around the country. But more fine, everything was sort of more aimed at the top end. It's yeah, I guess the best dining. kind of what I was going to ask is that yeah. if that experience from overseas has been you know, premium and cold, Correct. Uh, how do you then, you know, where do you say no to yeah. that actually really wants your wine? Because then you know, the first, first issue is getting the, the volume out there, then yeah. the next issue is saying no to the, you know, making sure your, your wine's in the right places. Yeah, well, this is the thing too. I don't want it to be snob- snobby either. There's this whole persona around the wine industry which... I didn't want these wines to be too expensive and I know that um, even though they are premium and they are top end and I have packaged them like that, 
I do want them to be approachable and maybe bring in consumer at the uh, lower end. Well, part, I guess part of the reason it has to be priced at a higher point is because of what goes into it and Correct. the hand picking and yeah. the, the labour component. Yeah. It's not a machine automated Correct. way of, of making wine. Yeah, um, and it's not cheap to make it that way. Um, so that is where the pricing comes in, but I kind of sort of also wanted to, didn't want to go too high and kind of wanted to keep on the lower end to start. So it was kind of a happy medium, and I'm quite happy for, if I went in and if I like the people, and they like my wines, and there's a reciprocal relationship, then I would love my wines in their restaurant or their yeah. place, yeah. So it's really restaurant first? Yeah, and the wine and wine stores, but more sort of fine, yeah, fine wine stores. It's not sort of the liquor king or that because they wouldn't take my wines anyway. Right. It's just sort of a yeah, I'd have to be making quite a lot of wine to be pushing through that sort of yeah yeah. So how many labels and varieties have you got now from those initial two silver and gold? Um, so now I've got on top of that I've got another premium uh, Ceresia. Yeah. So it's all based on colours, and it fits in with the paintings. So Argent Aurelin and Ceresia, and that's a Merlot Cabernet Franc. And then I brought in the Impression Red, which sits underneath that. And of course that enables me in those challenging years, or um, when I can't make the premiums, and I know the premiums aren't up to quality, it will go into the Impression Red. But I also... That was in 212 I made that first wine, but that was the most challenging vintage that I think Hawke's Bay has had in a long time. So I knew I was going to come up against that at one stage, and I thought, well, we'll put out the impression red. It's impression of the vintage, and it's just an impression of your artwork, really. Yeah. So I guess that gives you then something to fall back on. Um, Correct. Which is where, you know, other premium winemakers or wineries have been exposed in bad years because you, you, you're between a rock and a hard place. You either yeah, yeah. make wine that doesn't fit the label and brand and reputation you've built up yeah. or you don't do it and then you go out of business because you don't have the capital to support it. Exactly. So it, it sounds like a pretty smart yeah. decision to have that, that n- next tier down wine exactly. uh, always able to be made. But I guess another thing that I always... I never wanted to really go at the lower end because you have to sell so much more and your margins are less, so I kind of just, I'm sitting, so the impression red sits about the $25 mark, okay. yeah, I don't want to go any lower than that, okay. so that, and then the premium, the top ends, my Chardonnay sits at 35 and then the reds are 45 sort of 40 45 retail. Um, I've lost train of thought, I think. <laughs> I think that's, that's kind of an area that I can sort of segue into. Um, the awards that your wines have received. Yeah. We were talking about the different varieties and how many you've got now. Yeah. A- across the wines that you've now got available, mm-hmm. uh, what were some of the you know the highlights or a, an external validation that yeah. hey this is a stunning wine and you know when you saw the article or saw the publication where mm. all right this is this is kind of external validation that yeah. my vision of how it should taste and feel and be seen yeah. has has now been you know there's a tick in the box out yeah um it's started happening when i first released the cabernet and um yeah pretty blown away <laughs> the accolades that started to come um the 210 argent got um i think it was oh jane skilton i really respect jane skilton and i think there's a lot of wine writers in new zealand who are independent wine writers they can write what they want, and I, I, I like that. And you know what? If they don't like it, they'll write it. And I'm like, that's good, and that's what I want. I just don't want Yuri Fury. I want straight to the point. You know, if you don't like it, or tell me, or so. Anyway, I, I, I sent it through to um, Michael Cooper. Michael Cooper is another one, independent wine writer, whom I really respect. Um, again, he'll say it like it is. And um, Jane Skilton, Master of Wine. Um, uh, Joe Bazernska, again, another independent wine writer. But, um, and then there's... So anyway, um, Jane Skilton, first review I got, she did for the Independent Wine Monthly, and um, it was really cool because it was my cabinet, and she was just... She rang me up, and she says, Oh, my God, Jules. She said, Love your cabinet. 
and I was just stoked because she's a master of wine. Um, she's got a quite a strong sort of brutal reputation, and um, she's like, it's just brown. And she says, it's not green, it's not herbal, it's not, you know, good old Hawke's Bay sort of style, and um, she's like, it's stunning. And um, she says it's well crafted. And um, so anyway, she wrote an article for me in the Independent Independent Wine Monthly that she writes for. And she said that I'd spent eight years in Napa Valley, California, and I had a deaf tan with Cabernet Sauvignon. And I was like, yes, that's good. <laughs> that's a good start. <laughs> and um, did you find that that review translated into direct sales? No. Have you found that with any of the re- the, the rewards you've got? I don't think I've even touched the surface or people actually know. It's starting to. Yeah, initially no, because I think there was like, it was how do you get it out there? You've got this review, I mean that's great, but I'm not known, I've probably got 10 likes on my Facebook page, and <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So, so have you really let it just organically grow correct. through the local restaurants that have supported you yep. and from the premium wine retailers that either sell it online or, yep. or through local uh, liquor outlets? Uh, yeah, and the reviews really. Okay. So it's been organic, and I guess with working a full-time job, it has been it's been a challenge. But I think I, I like the organic approach because I feel, and also I like the word of mouth approach because nothing's kind of stronger than that. And it's allowing me to do it slowly and uh-huh. make sure it's you know I'm in it for a long time, not a short time. So I want it to be long and slow and solid. And organic growth is the best way to do that. Yeah, exactly. Then how do you determine when that moment is where the the full-time job um, moves away and your full-time job becomes collaboration? Um, I think that'll just, I think I'll just know. Oh no, it's time to go and um, time to move on. it's, I've, I'm starting to see the sales are increasing. Um, I've taken on it, my distributor came on board um, a couple of years ago. So for the first year I was sort of doing it, hand selling it myself, um, which is a heck of a lot of work. And once you start getting, you know, you've got so many listings, but it's only like 12 bottles here, six bottles here, two bottles here, one here. And it's, if you think about it, all that invoicing in there and dealing with those people, following up money, it was like, can't do this. There's a huge engagement cost, isn't there, yeah. to, to just get one outlet on board, and it may just exactly. be for the summer menu. Yeah, just exactly. for a case. And then it's turned over, and they'll pick up the next wine. So um, I was very fortunate, actually. Darwin Nash Fine Wines. I met Brandon, Brandon Nash, um, here in Hawke's Bay. He's got a really good, good following here in Hawke's Bay with the restaurants and reputation, and um, they've built up a very strong company, um, and they're their sort of philosophy is very much um, probably what aligned with what I do is it has started from a small business or and, um, and a passion for fine wine and they they really are in with a lot of the top end restaurants around the country and um, they're very much about hound sale and very much about boutique and um, it, it really They've followed in the same sort of ethos and et cetera that I, I felt was my own company, if that makes sense. Um, and I guess they help you and they help the restaurants because yeah. they're minimising your costs of engagement with hundreds of restaurants. Correct. And at the same time, they're making it really easy for mm. a restaurant to order from a huge number of boutique wine Yeah, brands. exactly. And I mean, now I've, I've probably got about 50, 60 accounts. I couldn't do that by myself. Yeah. Not yeah. and make the wine and as make well. the wine as well. So I need to focus on what I certainly am very much out in the trade. Being out in the trade and selling my wines is really important to me, and um, it's important to engaging the people. They need to know who's made this, who's made this wine. What, you know what's behind it. What's the story? The story is incredibly important. And I've learnt that over the years, sort of watching and observing and, and selling other people's wines, and um, yeah, sort of. Are you using trade shows or events or festivals yep. to get that story out there as well? Yeah, definitely. Um, so I've attended the New Zealand Boutique Wine Festival for four years in a row now, and that's in Auckland. And um, that's been a really good platform, and that's actually got Auckland up. I'm going quite strongly there in Auckland. It's strong for a small producer. 
um, really starting to get, get into some very top end restaurants up there and um, so that's been really good. Um, I'll be attending the Hawke's Bay wine celebration in Wellington this year and that's with the whole of all the other Hawke's Bay wineries. So I think the more I, my wines are seen up against the bigger producers and seeing that the quality's there just like the other producers, that um, it, it, it needs to be done and people need to see it. Um, and the Hawke's Bay charity wine auction, um, just I, I found that's been really um, it's been really good because especially within with the locals, um, you know, that that event's been going for years now and um, there's a real strong strong following there and a strong group of people that go there and um, I think to sort of start putting my wines out there again with the more um, well established wineries, um, yeah, it's been it's been warm. Now I also noticed that it's not just New Zealand restaurants and retail that enjoy the collaboration wines yeah. uh, that you've got something in place with Japan yeah. on the exporting side mm. so uh, that's kind of yeah. that's a big sort of success point how did that come about and, and what is it yeah that was really exciting actually um, again it happened organically um, it was probably the probably my second year and um, I had a phone call from Bill Vincent and he runs in Mount Eden a um, fine wine store up there. Um, really beautiful little um, boutique wine store and um, he's got amazing wines from all around the world and um, he procures wines for Wakanui Bar and Grill in Tokyo, Japan. So he basically you know, scouts out around the country for all the boutique small premium producers um, wines that he think will work well on um, Wakanui's uh, wine list and um, so it's a owned oh it's New Zealand beef and lamb um, in Tokyo and all New Zealand wines on the list um, so anyway he was scouting because he was looking for a replacement for a cabernet and he was scouting for cabernets on the um, on the internet and um, he came across, and of course I started to get the Parker reviews, which for anyone who doesn't know, um, Robert Parker, or The Wine Advocate, is um, an international fine wine publication. And I guess, a sort of sidetrack here, um, pretty, once you start getting in the 90s on that publication, you are starting to get, I guess you could say into, well, I'm not cult status yet, but... You know, your wines are pretty up there. Um, and um, my, so my wines, my Cabernets to date, all three, my first three cabs have all hit in the 90s and my first four, five Chardonnays have all been in the 90s, which is really good. Um, so he saw those reviews on online and um, he said, oh, can you send me some samples? And I said, sure. And um, so I sent some samples and he said, absolutely love your wines. He said, I really want to, I want to put your wines forward for the next shipment to go to Japan. Mm -hmm. I was like, really? That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> so I did, and they loved it. And they ended up by um, taking the Chardonnay as well. So, oh. yeah, so it's been really cool. Yeah, yeah. Very, so I guess it shows the, the importance of, of not just the supporting the you know, retailers of your yeah. wine, but also yeah. making sure that you do have those credibility indicators with reviews out there yeah. and that you do have your online presence so that when people are researching you, yeah. they're finding all the things that give them enough confidence to actually give you a call. Correct. Yeah. And exactly. then your wine needs to then actually you know, stand up, follow through once you send the sample. Yeah, no, exactly. So it's everything they say has organically happened and has occurred like that. And the more I see, you know, I've only touched the surface on like Facebook. I've got so much work to do on social media and I need to revamp. I now need to look at everything and sort of like three, four years on now, I've, I need to revamp my website. I need to come up with an actual social media plan. I need to, because I've seen how much, like even on my little 350 likes on Facebook, I've put up posts on that and I've been out and about and people are going, oh my God, I've seen your post. Oh, hey, that's an awesome review. Or they've turned up to a tasting at Mount Eden in Auckland or they've turned up to the Boutique Wine Festival and I've, I've actually been, I was kind of blown away because I was kind of sceptical at first, I was like, ah, oh, Facebook, you know, but 
It's the most efficient word of mouth. Exactly. And people have got a billboard on them in their pocket. Yeah. 24 hours a day almost. I mean, how could I have done that without, you know, sitting in my living room, have reached that many people? Yeah. And they actually, that actually got some of my first sales as well through my website. So it was mainly friends and family, of course, but it was like an instant, oh, here's a post, website's up and running, and oh, I got some sales. You know, everyone was like, cool. And um, but I couldn't have done that without having a presence online, and yeah. It'll be interesting to you know come back and have a chat with you in a few years once you've made all those changes. Yeah. Uh, to see actually where that then gets you. Um, if you were to, I mean, Julianne, you're obviously someone who's got a, a very long-term vision that yeah. you're executing on now for your business, yeah. um, for collaboration. You know, fast forward 10, 20 years from now, mm-hmm. what does it look like? You know, what have you achieved? What, what is the super picture completely realized? Yeah. What does that look and feel like? Oh, it's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> so I've got, um, I've got a salad door here somewhere in Hawke's Bay. I haven't quite figured out where it is yet. And I'll have all the original artworks back from California. They'll be, and I'm telling they're beautiful big original paintings. They're going to be on the wall. So I have my own tasting room. Um, probably be appointment only. <laughs> it's only because I always do such, I do such small volumes anyway. And I just want people to come in and it'll be a sit down experience because it is an experience and it's not just a, well, it has to be a whole experience. That's what it's all about and with the artwork, etc. Um, and yeah, and if I, if I have enough to um, just make a decent income for myself, I think I'd be really happy. And to be able to stay here in Hawke's Bay and, um, yeah, just financially make it viable, I think, because our industry is tough and a lot of people have, yeah, I mean, I've seen ups and downs over the last 20 years and like I think everyone else has. And um, you, you watch and you observe the companies that do well and those that don't and, yeah. I think what I, I like about your story is that you, you're deliberately avoiding um, you know, taking a whole lot of cash and, and growing super big and then having a whole lot of debt, uh, and that yeah. you're very happy and comfortable growing organically at a pace that not only suits you, mm-hmm. but suits how, um, how the awareness of collaboration wines is organically growing. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so that makes for a much stronger foundation when your business is 7, 10, 12 years old. So yeah. I congratulate you for, for taking that route in a, in a time in the market where you know, it could be very easy to mm. take the shortcut uh, route for growth. Yeah. No, thank you. Yeah. No, I'm, it feels right too. And it feels it's not stressful and it shouldn't be stressful and I don't want it to be stressful. So I think that organic approach and that calm and positive and being in a good place and all that, it all kind of, yeah, everything incorporates sort of, I guess, that slow organic approach. Mm. Now on a practical note, I haven't ordered from your website yet. Oh. Can you do a mixed dozen and, and I, if I order that online, oh, yeah, you'll absolutely. get sent out for the weekend? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Excellent. I'll uh, make I'll sure I do that. <laughs> Thank you. Well, thanks very much for your time, Julia, and you. um, yeah, good luck in the future. No, pleasure. Thank you. Very good. <laughs>